and you meow so much all day long. Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to answer some of your most frequently asked questions. I put a poll up on my Instagram a few days ago asking you guys if you had any questions about my Ironman race and there were a lot of questions that came through and I'm really excited to dive into some of them. Hopefully this video isn't too long but I am going to try and address as much as possible because I think there is a lot of curiosity surrounding Ironman and training for an Ironman. Swim 2.4 miles. Bike 112 miles. Run. 26.2. Brag. 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 Brag for the rest of your life. So whether or not you're actually interested in doing an Ironman or training for an Ironman, I think this might be able to help those of you who are interested in racing in a triathlon at some point, even a sprint triathlon, 70.3 all the way leading up to an Ironman. So without further ado, let's get started. So first and foremost, what percentage of the world's population finish an Ironman? So that's a good question. I believe it's 0.01%. Let me go ahead and Google it. So this number is specific to the amount of people who have actually finished finished an Ironman. There are a lot of people who have raced an Ironman but haven't finished in time and they do have a time cutoff of 17 hours. I was able to meet that cutoff by a little over three minutes. Even those people who didn't meet the time cutoff might have finished the Ironman but they didn't meet the time cutoff. So this is according to Quora. Today around 50,000 people finish any of the 25 full Ironman events per year depending on how we estimate the growth trajectory since the Julie Moss effect in 1982. Total finishers including repeats will be somewhere under 700,000. So the highest estimate it's 700,000 from a population of 7.3 billion or 0.01%. So that is the amount of people who finish an Ironman. Very interesting. How much time did you spend training daily for an Ironman? I spent anywhere from two to seven hours. So my two hour days would involve something like an hour strengthening session with a little bit of stretching and then a you know 45 minute run or 45 minute swim. Those were my low days. I did take a day off every couple weeks but my biggest days were around seven hours plus. Those days were the days when I was training on my bike. So usually those bike rides would get pretty long. The bike is the longest event in the Ironman. So we're talking 112 miles, which means you need to spend a lot of time on the bike while training. So those days I would be on the bike for like five hours. Then I do a 30 minute to an hour run after, and then maybe a strengthening session or something like that. How long do you think it would train for this? I started running four weeks ago and wasn't fit at all. It takes about 12 months to train for an Ironman. I would shoot for a year and a half. You want to have that buffer time just in case anything happens. You realize something about yourself or regarding what injuries you're prone to or nutrition. You want to kind of get all those bugs out early on so that the last six months you can really focus on training for that Ironman. I started training for this Ironman in February of 2017. So it took me around a year and a half, a year and three months to train for this Ironman. But I did have some injuries in between and I noticed and I was able to find out what works for me and what doesn't. So there's a lot to figure out when you train for an Ironman. It's a very big race and there's a lot of training involved. So I, I highly recommend going for a year and a half, a year when training for an Ironman. How do you feel after completing the Ironman? On one word, I feel euphoric. The, the buildup was definitely a lot more. I thought I'd feel a lot more high on life for a while, but there's always something that kind of brings you back down to reality as you get older and as you complete big events and achievements. It's kind of a depressing belittlement of what you accomplish and I think a lot of it has to do with other people, outside influences. I mean, it's it's amazing because I've had such a big group of support throughout this entire process and finishing and people who have been really happy for my finish. It really was a year and a half with all the training. It was like my expedition almost. And then that day just kind of signified everything. It was almost like the finish of my expedition that very last day in Yemen. And that kind of signified my record it attempt and, kind of and breaking that well. record. But I think I'm a little bit disappointed because I didn't finish in the time that I wanted to finish in. I was hoping to finish in like 12 to 13 hours or 14 hours and I was way off. I finished in 16 hours and 56 minutes. A lot of that had to do with issues during the bike with my IT band. So long story short, it's an amazing feeling to have accomplished an Ironman. The fact that 0.01% of the population finishes an Ironman, it really does make me feel that I'm worth something and I, I can accomplish something great so long as I put my mind to it and it just feels euphoric. How did you train while traveling or did you only start after? So if we're referring to Expedition 196, I didn't start training for my Ironman during the Expedition 
expedition. I started training shortly thereafter. During Expedition 196, I was still training, but it was only for road races, 5Ks that I would do on the road and stuff. In this past year and a half training for this Ironman, I've done a lot of travel, so I've had to learn how to adapt to training while traveling and being really busy and, and flying and everything like that. It's been something that I've, I've had to kind of shift my, tr my training peak schedule with. So if I see that I'm going to be traveling in two weeks and I see that that week I'm supposed to be running on Monday, swimming on Tuesday, run, swim on Wednesday, and then bike on Thursday, I'll shift the schedule around to move the swimming to later in the week when I'm going to be back. And I'll only focus on the running and biking and strengthening during those days when I'm going to be gone. And then maybe the next week I'll do a little bit more swimming and take some of the running out. So it's about adjusting the schedule, but always making it a priority while traveling. If there's something so important to you, like an Ironman, you really have to make sure you find the time and commit to it despite traveling and working while on the road. And I know a lot of us do travel quite a bit for work, myself included. So it's just about making that a balance, not looking at it as a vacation and able to kind of take a break from your from your training, but actually learning how to incorporate it into your, into your work life and to have it be that much of an importance to you is really crucial. Was it physically harder or mentally harder? This particular Ironman was definitely physically harder. Usually it's mentally more, more challenging for me when I do the 70.3s because I don't have a real reason to finish it other than just wanting to finish a race. I had a major reason to finish this race. It, it had been a goal since high school to finish my first full Ironman by the age of 30. I traveled every single country in the world. I wrote a book. I served my own business, my own nonprofit all before 30. And this was really one of the last goals I had to complete before the age of 30. And I've had issues with joints since I had Lyme disease at the age of 13. And kind of things started going downhill since then. You know, I've, I have some knee issues and that the doctor took an x-ray, told me that I, my long distance running days are over. This was when I was 24. Cause like the sockets of my knees are slowly falling out or something like that. And I went to the chiropractor last year. He said I had rheumatoid arthritis in my hip. I'm going to get a second opinion. And you know, a few years back, I found out I have a degenerative disc in my lower back. Arthritis runs in the family. So it doesn't matter really how healthy you are when your joints are in so much pain. It's really tough to, to justify doing an Ironman 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. The biggest goal for me was to finish this Ironman by the age of 30, along with all of these other goals to really complete this self of what I can accomplish given the time frame that I have. And I think we all have limited time to accomplish our goals. We really should use time as fuel to achieve what we want to achieve in life because we don't really know how much time we have left. And I like to be fueled by that as well. So there was no option to not finish this race. And even if it took me finishing the race past the cutoff time, even when they were packing everything up, I would have still finished the race because it, it was so important to me to finish. So mentally, I felt really strong with this Ironman, but physically there were a lot of setbacks. I noticed some IT band pain early on in the bike and during the run, the last half, I ended up having some GI issues. And I attribute that to having a couple handfuls of chips right when I started the run. So the first eight miles of the run were great and I had energy and I felt amazing. And then it just went downhill. And I think it had to do with those chips, which meant that I was deficient in sodium. So I ended up putting some salt in my tongue throughout the run and it was too little too late at that point. What was the hardest part about the race? Definitely the run. The last 10 miles of the run was the hardest part. Everyone at that point, I think is in excruciating pain. You've got like blisters all over. You have chafing. For those of you who don't know what chafing is, it's a very common term in the world of triathlon. You know, you're wearing this tri suit and no matter how much, you know, Vaseline you put like in this area or along your neck, you're still going to chafe because there's friction going on between you and the material. So the chafing ends up getting really painful. I, I got a lot of chafing around my neck from my tri suit, but the last 10 miles because of the pain, it was pouring rain, pouring rain. It was, it was freezing cold. Yeah, you know, I was just trying to get through it. I didn't know if I was going to make the time cut. My watch died. So I couldn't tell how much time I had left or my pace. And it was just really stressful and painful. What's next? Another Ironman? Mm, I think that was a one and done thing for me. If I can get a really great coach and if my priority is to race an Ironman under 11 or 12 hours, then it's something I would consider doing again. But right now, the amount of time it took away from my work priorities and the amount of time it, it took to train, it's not something that I'm really that passionate about to do again unless I'm getting paid for it. And that's not really feasible unless I'm a pro. So I really encourage everyone to try an Ironman if that's something you're passionate about. But I understand if you're not because it is a lot of work. It is a lot of training. It is a lot of pain. It is a lot of money to, to, to do these races. Yeah, I think that was a one and done for me. I'm pretty happy with just finishing one right now. Which was the toughest, the swim, bike, or run? The swim is the toughest for most people who do the Ironman. And that's just from speaking to so many people about it. And I get it. There's a lot of unknowns. I mean, it's dark waters or it's light waters, but there's tons of sea life. There might be seaweed, there's choppy waters and wind. The water might be freezing cold. The sun might be in your eyes. Plus you have all of these people kind of rushing up against you, grabbing onto your leg, pushing you, kicking you. It can get nerve wracking. And
and that the point in the race where actually the most deaths occur because people go into it, everyone's nervous that first 10 minutes, everyone's really, really nervous. The people who wanna go fast, go fast right out. Other people like myself like to go slow and kind of work their way into it to, to stay calm. But you cannot let your heart rate get too high and you cannot succumb to the chaos of it all. What I would recommend is everyone goes in in a bunch and the buoys are usually on the side, the left. I would recommend going all the way to the right or all the way to the left, depending where the buoys are, all the way to the other side of where people are. The buoys will be a little bit further from you, but it's totally okay. The most important part of beginning to swim, I think, is staying calm. So you want to kind of swim away from other people. Then you can slowly make your way back in. Look at how loud my meow meow is. Hello. Hi. Are you loud? You are. He's a loud kitten. You just like to talk. So you just want to stay calm then slowly work your way back into the crowd and just remember that there's kayakers there to help you they're everywhere there's also usually like at my race they had lily pads so you can rest on the lily pads and take a little bit of a break you can rest on the kayaks and take a break so long as you're not moving forward at all they encourage you to take breaks if you need to you can also just lay on your back and float or you can do the backstroke i mean what i'll do is i'll kind of start off i'll splash some water in my face so i get used to the cold water then i'll slowly dive in come up dive in come up so i'm kind of getting used to it as i'm starting and listen I'm not looking to win this race so it's okay for me to take the time to do this I, I imagine for you if it's one of your first Ironman races then it's okay to do this as well you're not really going after time the pros are gonna dive right in and just go 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 but you don't need to do that I just encourage going in moving in pretty slow and making your way through and just remaining as calm as possible so the easiest for me is to swim I grew up swimming in high school I've been doing triathlon since the age of 16 so for me it's the easiest event and then it would be biking and then running is the most challenging for me but it, it very with everyone for a lot of people the run is the easiest because they're not having to depend on any equipment or kind of floating in the abyss they're able to be grounded and it's more comfortable for them but now that you've done it is there some sort of training you wish you had focused more on I wish I'd focus more on running I kind of highly slacked in that category just going out and running 20 miles for me isn't really of interest I'm not sure why I mean I love doing short little runs you know up to six miles but long runs for me are a little bit too much and so I think I've, I kind of avoided that and just hope for the best that the Ironman would end up being okay and I'd end up finishing, but I'd never ran a marathon before this Ironman. I'd never biked more than 100 miles, so I didn't really prepare in either one of those categories very well. If I'd had a coach, I think I would have been pushed to train harder in, in biking and, and running. Um, the biking ended up being okay, but it still it was really slow, and I think it's because of the lack of training with the bike and run. I was training a lot, anywhere between 10 and 17 hours a week, nonstop, but I wasn't training efficiently, and I think that's where I didn't do as good as I could have I wasn't really utilizing that training time. I was just going through the motions of training. Advice you give your post self in terms of training that you wish you had. For those of you who are interested in racing anything from like a sprint triathlon to an Ironman, I highly recommend, and I wish I'd done this earlier, is strength training. I've always been into like bodybuilding and kind of getting those gains and like looking jacked, which I don't look right now because I'll get to that in a second. Developing the booty, I really love that. I've always loved it since high school, just like lifting heavy and seeing that bulk a little little bit but when it came to Ironman training it didn't matter how much glute work I did on my own my own like bodybuilding glute work I wasn't able to develop the glute strength that I needed to endure such distance racing so I ended up losing a lot of like muscle gains it's not the outside that matters with triathlon and Ironman training it's the inside it's those slow twitch fast twitch muscle fibers it's really gaining the the multiple facets of strength training and utilizing different aspects of your body in different ways in order to conform to swimming, running, and biking, and being able to endure distance racing for, for long periods of time. I ended up moving to Boulder to train with a coach here who trains a lot of the pro athletes. I literally moved here just to train with her because I saw the importance of strength training. The goal was to train with her to avoid as much injury as possible during this Ironman race. Unfortunately, I didn't get to train with her as much as I'd hoped, and I think that's why I actually experienced some of the pain during this past Ironman because I wasn't keeping up with the training with her. She was a really busy person, and I just honestly don't think she had the time, but regardless, Regardless, it's done and now I know how to incorporate more strengthening and less bodybuilding into my regimen for training for triathlons. I will keep this up. I'm not about to go do bodybuilding. I'm gonna keep up strength training. I like how it's leaned me out a little bit more and I'm not really looking to be bulky anymore. Although I will tell you that when you're doing strength training for Ironman, it's not like you're just letting go of all those heavy weights and just lifting like five pounders. I've actually lifted and pressed the most amount of weight I have in my entire life while training for this Ironman. I'll be like doing squats with 30 pound weight 
weight. Usually I only go up to 20. It's been a really beneficial thing. When in the race did you go numb? I went numb during the bike with my hands and I think it's a really common thing when it comes to triathlon. Unless you're on a triathlon time trial bike where your hands are up here, they can be relaxed. You're on a road bike with aero bars and that's what I have. So I'll be using my shifting on the sides, my brakes on the sides. So what they recommend you do is you wear gloves. I did wear gloves during the race and during my training now, but it doesn't 100% alleviate that numbness. It's weird because if I push my fingers together like this, my fingers have like no strength to push down. They're okay now, but usually a few days after my ride, they'll still sort of be like that. They'll feel a little bit like weak and it's only been in my right hand. So it is nerve wracking, but something that also happened during the race is something, one of the hundred elements you have to deal with when you're racing an Ironman or a distance race. Is it true that they don't allow music or headphones during the race? If so, why? Let's kind of break it down. Obviously the swim, you're not about to wear headphones. You don't need to, it's short, it's quick. You need to be alert. For the bike ride, it can actually be distraction if you're listening to music. If you have headphones in, you can't really be aware so much as to people who are looking to pass you or if there are cars or if you need to slow down or if Iron Man needs to announce something. It's quite dangerous when you have headphones in when you're cycling in general, but specifically when it comes to an Iron Man race, I understand why they don't allow that. Even if the music is on loud, people are in their own mindset and people don't want to hear that music when they're riding. So whether it's on speaker or headphones, they don't allow it and I understand that. There was a woman during Ironman Florida that I passed a few times who had her cell phone and she had music playing on speaker and I just was like, why do people do this? We're not allowed to, so why do you think that you can sort of thing? You can carry your cell phone on you during the race. You're not allowed to take it out. You have to leave it in at all times and if they see you on your phone, you're automatically disqualified. During the run, I don't know why they don't allow headphones. They allow headphones during half marathons and marathons, so I'm not sure why it's a thing during Ironman. I mean, they did allow headphones. I would have left my phone and my headphones in my running transition bag, so when I got off the bike, I would have picked that up and start the run. Well, I'm not sure still why they don't allow headphones during the run. I've heard, you know, there, there's like people who say, well, if you're doing an Ironman, you should be completely in it and in the zone and focused on your thoughts and your mental. It's like, that's what makes Ironman so challenging as well, is that you don't have any friends who can run beside you or family members, or you can't listen to headphones or podcasts. You have to just completely be in your own mind to finish the race. And the mindset aspect of racing an Ironman is oftentimes the most challenging. So trying to overcome that on your own without any outside sources, that's a big part of Ironman. But with that said, you know, if they allow you to rest on a kayak, they should allow you to, to have headphones, in my own personal opinion, during the run. How did you practice eating during the race or did you work with a coach to plan? I had a nutritionist last year after I had some GI issues at mile 50 during this training ride that I was on. I was pretty much profusely throwing up and I couldn't stop and I never had it that bad. So I had to go to the hospital, ER, $4,000 later. And it turned out that I just had like endotoxemia from overtraining and dehydration and even consuming so too many carbs in a short period of time. And I didn't know how much I was supposed to eat on the bike. And so when I went to the nutritionist, he actually helped me figure out based on my weight, my height, my sex, my BMI, my body percentage, my RMR, VO2 max. He took a look at all this data and was able to kind of figure out how much I need to be consuming during the race. But this wasn't for sodium hydration. It was just for calories, carbs, sugars. So for sodium, I had to take a sweat composition test this year. And that helped me really decide how much I sweat when I'm training and I'm pretty low sweater. My intake of sodium needs to match that in some sort of way. And that's how I kind of figured out how much I need to be consuming during the race. I will say that I made some mistakes and I didn't consume properly. Otherwise I wouldn't have needed those chips during the run. I was dying for those chips guys. So like, it's not like I'm just sitting there picking out at the aid stations. For some reason I needed them. And so I'm not sure why. I also took six Advil throughout the race. And mind you, it's a 17 hour race. For me, it was probably muddled with that. And then my nutrition that ended up causing some GI issues during the run. Do you think a physically challenged person can also try? It's 58 year old Richard Holcomb, number 214, back for a second try. He's legally blind and it doesn't matter to him. No, the thing that must occur at all costs is this time, cross the line. Yes, 100%. There was a, a man, I don't know if he was on his second or third lap, but he was ahead of me. He was in a wheelchair and he had wheeled the whole race, except for this one, obviously. And I just couldn't believe the amount of effort that he was putting into this and he was surpassing me. If you just search Iron Man success stories or Iron Man inspirational stories on Google, you'll see so many stories from people who have raced Iron Man despite their disabilities. I know there's like a father son and the son has cerebral palsy and he he takes him throughout through the whole race. The feeling comes Coming down the finish line at Leaky Drive, it, it's just an awesome experience. With the crowd there, all the excitement, the noise, and the announcers announcing all that, the adrenaline just gets flowing.
you know, and there's cancer survivors and people who are suffering all different types of ailments of life. It's amazing what people can accomplish with Iron Man. I would highly recommend looking into some of those videos and stories of inspirational people with disabilities who have finished Iron Man. It's more than doable. I finished with three minutes to spare on the clock and I'm well and able. I don't have any disabilities and look at how slow I am. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter when it comes to Iron Man. It doesn't matter your gender, your ethnicity, whether or not you're disabled. It's really fair game once you're out there. Everyone pretty much has an equal chance to finish the Iron Man. And you know, some of the pros have come from really bad pasts, you know, with drug issues and depression and whatnot and injuries, really bad, horrific injuries. Just days before the Iron Man World Championship in Kailua Kona, the world record holder is out after being hit by a truck. And they still surface. So it's all about willpower and determination and 110% commitment. And that's how you finish an Iron Man. And any, everyone has that within them. It's whether or not you want to actually unleash it.